Uh, it's really fantastic to see you all here today. What a terrific turnout. This is our first time getting together in this capacity in three years. So uh, yes, <laughs> so wonderful to see you all back together again. Tonight we're going to be talking about the link between good quality sleep and brain health, the significance of blood-based biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease, and the connection between cardiovascular health and brain health. Uh, I'll be your MC tonight. Uh, my name is Art Wallacek. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and uh, work at the WADRC as well as the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Dorothy Edwards, uh, she and I are the co-leaders of the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Corps of the ADRC. I want to welcome you and thank you for your en obviously enthusiastic participation in this event. Uh, I want to take a few moments to thank our many volunteers, so big round of applause for our ADRC staff. I'd also like to thank our premier sponsors, Brightstar and Vista West, who helped make this event possible. Their support assists us in bringing important education about Alzheimer's disease to our community. I hope you had some time to check out the resource fair and the associated cookies and other treats. We want to thank our exhibitors for participating this evening and contributing generously to the health of our community through the vital work they do. So you should have all picked up a red Wisconsin bag. If you didn't do that, please go, go grab one or raise your hand. We'd be happy to get you one. Take a look in there. There are a number of, of goodies in there. Uh, we want to want to point out a couple of things. So one is, oop, well, I'll point out that too. So check us out on our uh, on our website. Uh, some folks are asking about a recording of this, so we are recording, and we anticipate that this will be posted on our website probably within the next month or so. So check that out. Um, and take a look at uh, the Get Involved section of the website. If you want to learn more about how to participate in this work, please check that out. And also look in your red bags, and you'll see a flyer in there that'll have more information. Um, if you've been kind of following the new news over the last year, there have been a number of tremendous uh, news items and breakthroughs in Alzheimer's disease. That's possible through research and through the work that many of you who are participants in our research study have done and, and millions of people around the world. So we can hopefully prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease and other dementias through continued research. And so if you're interested in participating in that cause, uh, please check out our website, check out the material in the red bag, or come find one of us. We would be delighted to talk with you about what that looks like. You'll also see, I'm seeing some folks pulling out yellow pieces of paper. Those are the evaluation forms, so please fill those out. Uh, those are super helpful for us in terms of planning future events. Uh, also quite, oh, I see a hand raised over there. Turn the, the background music, okay. Someone will turn off, thank you, Max. For, oh, oh, okay. problem. We usually try to have a soundtrack for these meetings. <laughs> Thank you, Max. <laughs> okay, so you can include that in your evaluation. Turn off the music next time. But please include other feedback for us. It's really helpful to us as we plan future events. And it's actually also quite helpful for uh, continuing the work of the center for our future grant writing to continue our work. Uh, we you know, really value your feedback. So thank you for that. Uh, You'll also find uh, index cards in there. So we're going to have a Q&A session after our presentations today. So we really welcome your active participation in this. So if you have a question at the end, then just fill out one of those index cards. We'll have our staff walking around to pick those up. And we'll bring them on front, up front and uh, have our uh, brilliant presenters uh, answer your questions. A little bit of a final housekeeping note, so uh, turn off your cell phone or at least set it to silence uh, while, uh, while we're all up here. Okay, 
Terrific. So on to our fantastic um, speakers and presenters. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Sanjay Asthana. Dr. Asthana is the director of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He is the inaugural dire director. He's been at this for about 13 years or so, running the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He is an internationally renowned researcher and leader in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, he's also a clinician. He sees patients in the UW Health Memory Assessment Clinic, and he specializes in assessing and diagnosing persons with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. His father, an economist and diplomat for the United Nations, suffered from Alzheimer's disease, spurring Dr. Asthana's study of the disease. Uh, I, on a personal note, he's a, I value him as an incredible mentor and colleague, and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Asthana. How you all doing? Good evening. Nice to see you all. Welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, you heard that this uh, uh, symposium is being held about three years um, since the COVID pandemic. So it's great that we have a chance to meet again and share with you some exciting things that are going on in Alzheimer's research here. So as Dr. Wallacek mentioned, we do uh, have uh, a number of exciting uh, studies and, uh, and projects going on here at UW-Madison. But just to share with you, uh, the present state of Alzheimer's uh, here in Wisconsin and the country, uh, we have over 6.5 million Americans who have the disease. Uh, and of course, uh, that is likely an underestimate of the actual number of people who have the disease in the country. Um, and in Wisconsin, we have about 120,000 people who have the disease. And by 2025, uh, which is what, about uh, 20 odd years uh, not even 20 odd years, about three years from now, <laughs> we will have about 130,000 people who will have the disease uh, in our state. Uh, Alzheimer's now is the seventh most common cause of death in the country. It used to be uh, six, but COVID has taken over, so we know how many deaths have taken place from, from the pandemic. Uh, but it is the seventh uh, leading cause of death in the country. And for those who are over 65, it is the fifth most common cause of death in the country. And worldwide, there are about 40 million people with the disease, and that number will exceed 100 million in the next about 20 years or so. So the, so the prevalence of the disease uh, is increasing, um, and the hope is that as we find effective treatments and hopefully one day uh, some prevention strategies and cure, that we'll be able to control the number of people who have the disease. So we have one of the NIH-designated centers of excellence in Alzheimer's research here at UW-Madison. Uh, it's the ADRC. Uh, there are presently 37 ADRCs funded by the NIH across the country. Uh, and we were the first ADRC based in geriatric medicine almost. Majority of them are neurology-based uh, centers. So we were one of the first centers to be funded who were based in geriatrics. And now we have another center at Duke and UNC Chapel Hill who are also uh, experts in geriatrics and dementia. Uh, the uh, disease, um, the center here involves about 40 plus scientists, and these scientists, they are spread throughout the campus of UW-Madison. So it is not just a school of medicine program, but rather uh, it, it really uh, spreads all over the campus. Uh, and we have uh, over 100 staff, students, trainees who are involved with the center. It's quite an extensive program that is growing rapidly over time. So here is the uh, very, uh, in briefly, the structure of the ADRC. It has multiple components to it, what we call as cores. Um, and I would like to draw, draw your attention to some, some uh, specific cores. Uh, one of them is the clinical core. You see core B written there. Core B is led by Dr. Carlson, who is a speaker tonight. So you'll hear from her. Uh, this core follows almost 1,100 participants who enrolled in the ADRC over the last 12 years or so. Uh, ADRC was funded in 2009, so it's been in existence uh, for, uh, for quite a bit of time. Uh, and these 1,100 people, they participate in about 50 active studies at any one time. So there are a lot of projects ongoing. 
Um, and this core collects extensive data, follow-up data, prospective data on these participants uh, about, the, about the cognitive test, the medical exam, the brain imaging, the spinal fluid exam, and so on and so forth. So we have extensive data on these participants that we share worldwide so that we can really uh, enhance research in, uh, across, the, across the world and not just across the United States. Another major core, core D that you see there, neuropathology core, has a large brain bank. So there are people who donate their brains for research, um, and this core uh, processes, uh, processes those brain tissues. Uh, and presently, we may have over 300 brains uh, in the brain bank, and that really helps us understand what causes the disease, um, and really at the microscopic molecular level, understand uh, how the disease develops over time. There's also the core E, Core E uh, helps us recruit participants into the, into the center. They have a lot of community-based activities that some of you may have attended over time, um, and that's a critical core for our uh, center. Core F, you see there, led by Dr. Kerry Gleason, is uh, critical to diversify the participants who are in our center. So they really focus on recruiting participants from underrepresented groups, African-American, American Indians, and we are attempting to increase uh, the number of Hispanics who are in our center. This really will help us understand how the disease differs between races and ethnicities. Everything we see in the non-Hispanic white population may not apply uh, to other races and ethnicities, so it is important for us to understand the disease in various races um, and, and ethnicities. Uh, and then we have the core G. Core G is the biomarker core. Uh, this is, uh, this core, it is led by Dr. Sterling Johnson, um, and it um, collects all kinds of biomarkers data, the blood, the CSF, the brain imaging data. And these biomarkers really help us understand how the disease pathology starts when someone has no symptoms and how it progresses over time. There's the RAC core led by Dr. Bendlin. She's a speaker today. Uh, and uh, the RAC core is training the next generation of scientists in Alzheimer's research here at, at UW-Madison, um, and our hope is that that group of investigators will expand and will, will really conduct some innovative research in the future. And finally, core H. Core H is the, is the dementia care research core. This is where we try and find new ways to treat people who are already suffering from the disease. What are the best ways to give them the best care and help them uh, you know, deal with the devastations of the disease? So this is the overall structure uh, of the ADRC, and as I mentioned, multiple people are involved um, uh, that, uh, that conduct the studies under the auspices of the center. So we have two pillars uh, that comprise the Alzheimer's program at UW Madison. One is the ADRC that, that I just described to you. The other one is the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute, which is led by Dr. Carlson. Uh, and this institute uh, is closely tied to the public health, uh, health services research and educational initiatives. Um, and they, uh, they also support the famous RAP study, uh, which uh, many of you uh, know about it. Probably some of you are enrolled in that study. Um, and that study is independently funded by NIH and led by Dr. Sterling Johnson. Uh, the institute, apply, you know, it employs about 30 plus faculty and trainees. And the ADRC and the WAI together, they comprise the full spectrum of research in Alzheimer's disease, which is from molecular biology uh, to clinical research to dissemination research and then community-based research. So between the two pillars of a program, we have full scope of research that take place here at UW-Madison, which is quite unique to this university. The uh, ADRC, as I mentioned, uh, has over almost 1,100 people. Some of them have Alzheimer's disease. Some of them have the diagnosis of MCI. Some of them are at risk for the disease because one of their parents had the disease, uh, and, and so they are contributing to the research data. We collect, as I mentioned, extensive research data which are shared locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, and the WAI supports the RAP study, um, and also uh, uh, it, it, uh, it is collaborating with multiple inst uh, international institutions um, and collaborates with the ADRC in a big way. The data collected between the two centers are very harmonized so that we can integrate the data uh, and the uh, RAP is about 1,700 people. So between the ADRC and RAP, we have over 2,700 people who participate in our research studies. You may have heard about some uh, exciting 
uh, development and treatment of the disease. How many of you know about aducanumab? Heard about that, which was the first FDA-approved medication uh, that really is a disease-modifying treatment in that it clears the amyloid protein in the brains of people with the disease. And very recently, a press release was made by another uh, on another medication called licanumab. So licanumab and aducanumab, the, the word MAB at the end of these medication uh, means monoclonal antibodies. These are the antibodies that are infused into people with early Alzheimer's disease and MCI, and these antibodies go and clear the amyloid protein in the brain, one of the two abnormal proteins that get deposited in Alzheimer's disease. So licanimab, uh, licanimab sorry, is, uh, is a agent which is a medication that is with the FDA, and we may expect approval from, from FDA for licanimab very soon. Uh, this is the medication where, in addition to clearing amyloid protein in the brain, uh, they, uh, the studies have found improvement in symptoms of the disease as well. Aducanumab did not quite show effective symptomatic effects, uh, uh, but, but licanumab can actually uh, improve some symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and slow the progression of the disease. So we'll have more uh, discussion on these two medications, perhaps during the question times. Uh, I want to share with you um, the Wisconsin Medicine Initiative and the Initiative to End Alzheimer's Disease. The Wisconsin Medicine Campaign is a fundraising effort by UW Medicine, and it's raising, it focuses on patient care, on research, education, and health equity as it relates to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is really attracting uh, donations and funds uh, from people across the country. Who, uh, who want to enhance research in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias so that we can prevent and treat these medications. So hopefully some of you may have made the donation to this program if you're interested. Um, we'll give you more information how to donate for Alzheimer's research here at UW-Madison. But Wisconsin Campaign and the IEA are the fundraising arms of the University for Alzheimer's Research. We have number of open studies. We're recruiting for number of studies. We have details on these studies, and we'll provide them to you. But there is something known as the Alzheimer's Recruitment Registry. If any one of you is interested in being a part of our research, just contact us, and then we'll provide you more information about the registry. You can stay in the registry, and whenever the right study comes your way, uh, you can enroll in that. We just collect some very basic information for you, from you for enrollment uh, in the registry. And we have other. Uh, projects ongoing, and we'll talk about them uh, momentarily. So uh, with that, I want to uh, invite Dr. Barbara ben Benlin, who is going to talk about the dementia care research. Dr. Benlin is professor of medicine in the uh, Department of Medicine, Division of Juridic Medicine. Uh, she's a renowned scientist, has multiple NIH grants. She had done breakthrough research um, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, she also is director of the, uh, of the research education core of the ADRC. Uh, her research focuses on various uh, factors that increase and reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease, and she has published multiple breakthrough papers in that area. Truly a pleasure to, to invite Dr. Barbara Benlin to make her presentation. Dr. Benlin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's really great to see this wonderful turnout and to all be here together this evening. As Dr. Stana mentioned, it has been a number of years since we've had this opportunity to be here together. So thank you for coming. Also hope you're enjoying your uh, decaf coffee. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Uh, Bartzi later, and I think he probably suggested we were not allowed to have caffeine at this time of day. <laughs> So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit just actually about a research opportunity. So this is in um, the area of dementia care. Uh, what is dementia care? Uh, so this is research, uh, as Dr. Astana mentioned, which helps us understand how to better serve people who are uh, living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And this type of research can be at the systems level, looking at um, healthcare institutions, healthcare delivery, um, the economics of delivering care and access to care. 
Uh, it is also uh, research on uh, provision of care by healthcare providers. Who has access to this care? Um, what kind of factors impact what kind of care you can receive? Uh, do you live in an urban environment? Do you live in a rural environment? Um, what's the training of those individuals who are providing that care? What kind of uh, social services are available to you in your community and do you have access to those services? Um, as well as what is the experience of care partners? So individuals who are providing uh, care and partnering in care with people who are uh, living with dementia. What do your good days look like? What do your bad days look like? How can we reduce uh, isolation? How can we reduce burden? How can we care for people longer at home? So there's a number of things that we research that can uh, serve people who are living with uh, dementia. So at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, we're building infrastructure to increase this type of research. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we can also partner with you if you're interested in being in this type of research. If you're someone living with dementia and you have a care partner, uh, you may be eligible to participate. Um, so we do have a table here this evening. Um, Audra Kosick is one of our uh, program coordinators, um, and there's also others in the room that can talk to you about this. Uh, we encourage you to learn more, and you uh, can join this project. Uh, so if you're living with uh, dementia or you are a family member or a friend or someone else who's partnering with someone living with dementia, we'd be really, we would really love to talk to you. So uh, thank you again for being here this evening. Uh, we have a really nice lineup of talks. Here's the contact. Feel free to take a picture of the screen if you want to learn more or a talk to uh, Audra at the table after the event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benlin. It is my great pleasure now to introduce our first presenter tonight, Dr. Steve Barzi. Uh, Dr. Barzi is a, a colleague of mine at UW. He's in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology. He's an attending physician at the William S. Middleton VA. He is the interim director of the GREC. The GREC is a very cool program at the VA. It's the Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center. So it's a whole uh, set of programs around the country at various VAs uh, studying the effects of aging in, in veterans. Uh, he has a number of educational and clinical roles. Uh, uh, I love referring my patients to Dr. Barzi because I will get back these incredibly thoughtful, detailed, and very helpful notes about how to best help my patients who are suffering from troubles with their sleep. And that's what we're going to hear about tonight, the relationship between sleep and memory. So please welcome Dr. Barzi. Well, good evening, everyone. And um, again, welcome. Uh, I uh, do love to talk about sleep uh, almost as much as I like sleeping. And, and so I'll just uh, right up front offer up that if any of you need to take a brief nap during the course of my talk, <laughs> I'm okay with that. So. so there's a lot of opportunity when we start thinking about different risk factors and how risk factors affect our ability to think and process. And we know, and we've known for quite a while, that sleep both influences how we process right away. And anyone who's ever had a really bad night's sleep can attest to this the next day. But we also are now starting to get signals that uh, there is potentially a downstream effect of people who have struggled with poor sleep. And in fact, there seems to be some evidence to suggest that poor sleep in midlife may contribute towards uh, memory illnesses in later life. So uh, when we start talking about the, the circumstance of sleep and, and why it's vital for brain health, you know, we can think about a, a few different areas. We, we know that in animals and humans alike that when we sleep, uh, there are really important things that are happening with our memory traces from that day. And we are storing away some of that memory. We are getting rid of some of the junk, the things that we don't need to remember in the weeks or years to come. Uh, we are preparing ourselves 
for appropriate rest and uh, there's a lot of brain maintenance happening. Um, as I'll talk about in a moment, we've discovered in recent years that some important uh, chemicals that can accumulate in the brain and contribute towards memory illness, uh, in fact, seem to be removed from the brain during phases of sleep. Uh, additionally, we know that uh, emotional or psychological state and sleep are tightly linked together. And uh, when we sleep well, we have better control over our emotions. And finally, when we are sleeping, there are chemicals that are being secreted through our body that are those typical stress hormones or stress chemicals. And those seem to really wane during this phase of our life, this one third of our life, in fact. So taking just a couple moments, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is sleep. And then from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we understand about sleep in its relationship to memory. And finally, I'm going to have at least a few slides to encourage all of you to uh, consider ways that you might tweak or improve your own sleep habits for the sake of your brain. Um, so sleep used to be felt as something where in between wakefulness and coma. But the reality is our brain is very active when we are sleeping. And certain areas of the brain are probably as or even more active than when we're awake. What we realize is sleep is a very important biological rhythm. And it's linked to all kinds of outside uh, signals that help us to know uh, when we need to be alert and when we don't. These rhythms, or circadian rhythms, if you're familiar with that term, are, are very important drivers for when we sleep and how we sleep. I mentioned before sleep is an active process. For years and years, we've hoped that sleep was something like a switch in our brain. And when we were, the switch would go, then people would fall asleep. Well, it's really much more, uh, as I describe here, like an orchestra. And there's a whole bunch of players in an orchestra. And some of the players have to be louder, and some have to be quieter. And for all that to occur, then we, we move into this phase of sleep. But we know that there are many ways, in fact, that sleep can be altered. And there are many things that happen in our lives that can influence our sleep, many emotional factors. Something really startling in your life can, can play out into that night or many nights to follow. This slide here just depicts what I was talking about, that sleep is a biological rhythm. And it's linked to light in a very powerful way. And in the mornings, when light comes up, there's all kinds of signals in our body for us to be more focused and alert. And then timing like now, when it starts getting darker, our body starts to go through certain set steps preparing us for that night's sleep. I've already talked a little bit about the role of sleep, but I just want to point out one or two other factors. Not only is sleep important for many dimensions of our brain, but it also does important things for boosting our immune system. There are certain hormonal processes that really only occur when we're sleeping. And there's even aspects of creativity or thinking novel thoughts and things that correlate with important phases of sleep. So all in all, sleep is a really good thing uh, and I don't have to probably convince any of you of that. When we, under, when we study sleep, and I'm not going to get into the science of all this. There's a bunch of squiggles up here. These are just different brain waves. And those different brain waves occur at different phases of sleep. And that's how we know when a person's in a, in a lighter phase or in a deeper phase of sleep. We also understand that aging itself has some important impact on these different waves or patterns. And in general, when we're very young and our brain is in very significant phase of development, we spend a huge amount of time in deep or slow wave sleep. And then as we get older and older, um, we kind of get to a, a different phase where we have a certain percentage, about 20% or so, of deep or slow wave sleep. And then as we move into 
our 60s and 70s and 80s and such, the amount of slow wave sleep drops off some. We still have deep sleep, but it's just not as robust as when we're younger. Um, this is a common question I get, which is, oh, I'm getting older now. I don't need as much sleep. I'm not sleeping as much. Now, there's a difference between need and ability to sleep. <laughs> and what we realize is that when you look at a person at any age, and if they're not sleeping adequately, you can pick that up by behaviors. You can measure that they're more sleepy. If you put them in a quiet room with dim lights, etc., they're going to go out a little quicker if they're sleep deprived. And so what I always like to point out here is the difference between, say, an older adult as defined by some arbitrary number like 65, um, compared to adults, it's not that big of a difference. If you look up there, it's an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour. So really, when people come to my sleep, geriatric sleep clinic, and we talk, and they say, I'm getting four hours of sleep. I must be doing OK, because that's just what my body needs. Uh, that may not be what the body needs. And there may be other factors, as we'll talk about in, in a little bit. This slide is just showing something that everybody in this room already understands and knows, which is that as we get older, our tendency to have more sleep difficulties go up. Uh, and in general, at all ages, problems falling asleep are probably more common, followed soon after by problems staying asleep. And, um, but it's not an up, 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 up thing. Really, probably by around 40s and 50s, we start hitting this new plateau. So this is my first challenge to all of you, which is I would like to debunk a couple of myths that are out there. So f the first myth is this thing that I just mentioned, which is that sleep inevitably gets worse as we get older. And that's not true. I can say that from several different perspectives. I have many a patient in my geriatrics practice who are in their 90s or more who are quite satisfied and happy with their seven or eight hours of sleep. So it's not universal. But there is more of a a risk for having fragile sleep as we get older for various reasons. Also, there's this other perspective, which is, oh, yes, I have a sleep problem, but eh, I'm not going to take any pills, and it's just going to be the way it is. And that also is probably an error in thinking. And what I'd like to suggest by the end of these next few minutes is that every one of you can enhance your sleep with certain adjustments or certain considerations. This is a very complicated graphic, and don't spend too much time studying it, but the idea here is that sleep deprivation does a lot of really bad things to our body. It influences our memory, it influences our attention, it influences our blood pressure, and it influences our ability to tolerate and perceive pain. So you just keep moving around the list here. It influences blood sugar control. It influences our weight. So it's important that we do what we can to avoid sleep disruption or sleep deprivation. Sleep and memory. This is the, the emphasis of tonight, right? Um, and what we know, and this is really a very brief summary um, but we recognize from research that's been done in animals and in humans uh, that there are different phases of sleep. Remember those different squiggles I pointed out earlier? Some of those phases of sleep have very specific things that happen with regards to our memory. So for example, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, deep or slow wave sleep seems to be a time when we are taking more immediate or short-term memories and storing them away to our deeper memory file or a longer-term file. Whereas dream or REM sleep, everyone here heard of the term REM sleep before? Okay, 
REM sleep seems to be very cl more closely correlated to procedural memory. So certain things that you might learn that require some kind of muscular um, component, and it's more than just a, um, storing it away as a, a single piece or a fact. Um, we also realize that some aspects of our sleep are more important for emotional control um, and such. So, so each of these phases of sleep seems to correlate with different aspects of our memory and memory processing. This is just a picture for me to say that there are two main kinds of uh, approaches or theories that we now kind of recognize that correlate sleep and memory. So this one is probably the one that has the most robust or significant evidence in recent years. So we have these place, this place in our brain, the hippocampus, which is very important for memory. And there are certain things that happen when we learn and certain activities or things that occur in the hippocampus. But those events are in a fragile state. And only when we then go into sleep and specifically go into, as I said, that deeper, slow wave sleep, do we start to kind of see the, these oscillations, these small memories kind of being reactivated? And so as these memories are reactivated, you know, maybe it'd be too simplistic to say practiced, then some of the connections get stronger. And the things that don't kind of meet the cut as far as, as what's, you know, what's perceived as important they actually can lose their strength and fade away. I do not remember what I ate for breakfast 400 days ago. I don't even remember what I ate for breakfast five days ago. And that's an example of things being pruned out. This is the other main hypothesis out there. And this particular hypothesis specifically corresponds with that when we learn there's a cost. When we learn something, like in the left lower corner here, we have these little branches. We'll just call those branches connections. Those connections are memory elements. And as the day progresses, so a new memory element may mean that one of those branches gets a little stronger. But then when we go to sleep at night, what happens is we need to kind of reconcile all this energy expended. And so what ends up occurring is that we upscale, or at least preserve some connections, but we downscale a whole bunch of other things. And so by the end of the night, there's been this kind of purging and strengthening process that goes on, if that makes sense. We also understand that there's all kinds of things that accumulate in our brains, and some of those things are not healthy for our brain. And in fact, we know that our brain is constantly making all of these proteins which are folded in ornate ways so that they do certain things. But sometimes those proteins get gummed up or influenced in ways where they get misfolded. And so in a good sleep situation, we are balancing out and getting rid of some of the junk, some of those misfolded proteins. However, we have evidence to say that when we have impaired sleep, that there tends to be a, a, a kind of shift in this balance. And then all of a sudden our brain is not clearing out some of those, those elements to the extent that they should be. And that then leads, of course, towards other downstream effects that we're learning more and more about. The last point I'll make about sleep and memory is, is one that relates to this, this uh, process called beta amyloid. People here in the room familiar with beta amyloid? So it's felt to be an element that accumulates in the brain in certain types of memory illnesses such as Alzheimer's. And there's a balance between when the, the particular chemical or the substance is kind of in one state or in another state. And we know that sometimes when the, this particular molecule accumulates in a certain way, it gums up and produces um, damage in, in the brain, or that's what we suspect. At night, there are some really impressive things happening in our brain to clear out this beta amyloid. And when we are not getting adequate sleep, that clearance of beta amyloid is not the same. 
So one could see then how there'd be a relationship, not just the short term for memory, but downstream, if you're having poor sleep in midlife, what might that mean for your brain and brain health 10, 20 or more years later? Okay, last thing I'll say uh, is naps are good. <laughs> and there's all kinds of great, great evidence to suggest that if you learn something and then you take a nap, you will remember it better. So I'm just all about naps. Okay, okay. Final, I think I have just a minute or just a few minutes more, but this is where I want to encourage all of you to recognize that our sleep is a life rhythm. And so we need to, to guard it and protect it. Okay, these are some standard questions that we'll often ask people. And I'm not going to go through a diagnosis of people in the audience today. But suffice it to say that people, if you aren't satisfied with your sleep or others around you aren't satisfied with your sleep, maybe something should be done. These are some examples of some of the things that can interrupt or disrupt our sleep. At the very top, for a good reason, are poor sleep habits or behaviors. But there's a whole host of other things, medical health problems, shifts that can happen with that clock I was talking about, mental health issues or medical or psychiatric diagnoses, and then over here, sleep disorders, which I spend a fair amount of time focusing on in my clinics. So think for a moment about optimal sleep conditions. And I don't even have to let you look at the screen. You could give me some of this information. But there needs to be a strong and positive relationship with that bed and sleep. If you go to bed every night struggling and lying in bed and getting angry because you can't sleep, guess what that bed environment is going to become? <laughs> Not that sedate and calm respite place anymore. It's important for us to decompress before we put our head on the pillow. It's important to follow certain standard sleep habits and hygiene. And this is all stuff you've heard many times before, so it's nothing new. But our body is so linked to schedules, so linked. And so you do need to get in a rhythm, whatever that rhythm is for you, and stick with it. Napping, I just said, was a great thing. But everything can be done in excess. And anybody who's sleeping three or four hours in the day, do not expect to get another eight hours at night. <laughs> Exercise and activity. Exercise is good. Hopefully, I think you'll hear about it from many people tonight. Exercise is kind of one of the best medicines we have to offer, truthfully. But exercising too close to bedtime is not a good thing because it get, increases our core body temperature, and that doesn't allow us to sleep well. And then there's all kinds of vices out there. The comment I'll make is alcohol helps you fall asleep, but it will wake you up repeatedly through the night. So don't think that alcohol is going to keep you asleep. It will not. Lots of pictures up here, lots of things in the environment. Okay, I'm gonna just skip along here. But you, you've heard, we now know blue light playing around on our tablets right before bedtime. Not a good thing. Okay, I'm gonna, the, at the bottom of this slide here is, I just wanna point out, there are some tasks or activities you can do to help with your sleep. We all process, we all worry about tomorrow. You can create a worry list in advance and so you've already done the thinking. So when you wake up at 3 in the morning and you're wondering, am I going to get back to sleep? You don't have to do the worry list then. Um, it's important to create quiet space before we climb into bed. That's another real obvious thing. But I guarantee you everybody in the room breaks that rule. Um, and a cooler environment is better. Um, sometimes people will even take a a hot bath or a warm shower, and then as their body is quickly cooling, that's a great time for our brain to want to sleep. Okay, I'm going to, because I know I've passed my time here, I'm gonna skip through, I just wanna make one or two final comments. Um, so we did talk about the sleep disorders, and so there's a whole bunch of them out there. 
I just want to point out that in almost all of the common sleep disorders, we do see a bump up as we get older. Unlucky us. But there are ways we can manage all of these. And so I just want to make one comment about one of them, which is this phenomenon of sleep apnea. Okay? It's, it's one of many sleep disorders, but it's a common one in our culture, in our society. And as you can see here, and I apologize for annoying you with that graphic too long. But the idea here is if you lie down, the back of your tongue can fall back, things get uh, more tight in space, and sometimes airflow doesn't come in and out the way it should. And that can produce a whole bunch of effects, such as tiredness and sleepiness, which are obvious, but less obvious things like nighttime urination. Um, and as we've been talking about, memory and cognition. So final slide here, I think, which is this whole idea that we all have an opportunity to improve many aspects of our life, including our sleep. And this includes some of the rules I talked about. More importantly, if you or a loved one has a sleep issue, don't live with it. Get some kind of attention. Talk with a health provider. Explore some of those points on that star. Remember I said those points on the star? So, you know, the medications, the health issues, maybe the, the sleep circadian rhythm issue. So just be aware that there are ways you can seek out assistance with others. So I hope and I think that there'll be some resources out there. Uh, maybe you'll have even copy of slides at some point. You will, I think, on the website. So these are some references and things that I often will talk about. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful sleep tonight. <laughs> That was fantastic. Thank you. Lots of great reminders about the importance of sleep and napping. That's, I love that. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Barzi. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Nate Chin, who is a colleague, friend, and a neighbor. Lives about a block away. He is the medical director and clinical core co-leader of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He is also the medical director uh, of our sister study, RAP, the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. Uh, he's a clinician. He sees patients at the UW Health Memory Assessment Clinic. He studies lifestyle-associated risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. He oversees the clinical care provided to research participants. And he is the host of what's probably the best podcast in the world related to dementia, the Dementia Matters podcast. So. I highly recommend checking it out. Don't download it tonight because you want a good night's rest. Don't use your electronics. But first thing tomorrow morning, if you haven't listened to the Dementia Matters podcast, go download it. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, Dr. Chin. Thank you, Art, for that introduction. Uh, and please do download the podcast whenever you can. I, I like to see the numbers go up. I am pretty OCD about it, so thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here, whether it's because you're involved in research now or you have an interest in it, or you just wanna know how can we protect our brains or what are scientists doing to help you protect your brains. We appreciate your presence here and it's certainly welcomed. Uh, so my talk today is on blood-based biomarkers uh, in Alzheimer's disease and is, are we ready for blood-based biomarkers? I do not have any financial disclosures, which is relevant because it's gonna seem like I'm promoting them, but we're just really excited about blood-based biomarkers and its potential. I don't work for any of the companies that make blood-based biomarkers, although I hope to. And what I mean by that is that our own institution, our great program that we have here is working on a blood processing lab so that we can conduct some of these novel uh, studies and, and techniques that you're gonna hear about. So the question at hand is, is the future now? Are blood-based biomarkers ready for prime time? And my answer to that is maybe. And the reason for that is that context and purpose matter. More specifically, what is the setting in which we're talking about blood-based biomarkers? Is this a clinic? Is this a research study? Or is this public health doing mass screening? Who is the individual that is giving this blood-based biomarker, who likely wants the result of it? Is this a healthy person? Is this a person who has cognitive impairment? And lastly, what questions are we asking of the blood-based biomarker? This is a tool, so what are we hoping we're going to learn from it? What is the outcome that this blood-based biomarker may deliver us? 
And that's important because one blood-based biomarker can be used in multiple different contexts and, and be used for multiple different questions, and they may not be accurate for the particular question we're asking. So all these things are really important, and it, it adds to the complexity of this question of are we ready for it? And I'm hoping to carry that message through this presentation. But because context and outcomes matter, I want to give you a few hypothetical situations. And I'm using cartoon characters not to make light of the situation, but actually the opposite. We take it very seriously, and I don't want to put a person's face to a scenario that I hope they don't have to encounter. And so Minnie here is a patient of mine, and she's living with dementia. And we've ruled out a lot of different causes for her, but she wants to know, is this dementia due to Alzheimer's disease? And right now, in clinic, I cannot definitively tell her that. It's a very reasonable question. Now, Mickey, on the other hand, he has a family history of dementia, and he's starting to develop his own thinking symptoms. And he wants to know, does this blood-based biomarker tell him if he has dementia? And if not, will it tell him if he will develop dementia in the future? Again, a reasonable set of questions. And Donald, on the other hand, he's a healthy research participant, but he's getting older, and he wants to know, will a blood-based biomarker tell me if I'm going to develop symptoms? Will it tell me if I will develop those changes in the brain of amyloid and tau, or will it tell me if I have any cognitive impairment? And so in order to answer that, I'm hoping um, to go through a few more slides with you, and we'll see if, if we can come to some conclusions. But first, what is this biomarker that I keep referring to? And so a biomarker is an objective measure that is collected from blood, other body fluids, or tissues, and it captures normal or abnormal biological processes and conditions. So when I say objective, I mean it's valid and it's reproducible, and it reflects what's going on inside of a body or a cell. And it could be a normal cell or body or something that has disease. And you may not be familiar with the term biomarker, but you certainly have encountered it in your life. And that's because you've likely had your temperature checked. And your temperature is a biomarker of your internal body temperature. You've likely had your blood pressure checked or had to step on a scale in a clinic or know what your BMI is. These are all biomarkers that we use in clinical practice. More salient to this talk is the blood. Many of you who have gone and seen a healthcare provider have had to give blood and be tested. And whether that's looking for a cholesterol level or being screened for diabetes or seeing if your kidney function is normal, these are all biomarkers that we use to tell you what's going on inside of your body. And so with that in mind, what are the current biomarkers that we're using in Alzheimer's disease research? And for those of you that are participants, you've already seen this, you've probably already gone through most of these things. But in the upper left, you see an MRI scan. That will tell you about the structure of your brain, the size of your brain, and the blood vessels that feed it. In the bottom middle, those are PET scans. So the left one is an amyloid PET scan showing the presence of amyloid. The one on the right is a tau PET scan showing the presence of tau. We have other PET scans. There's glucose PET scans that show the metabolism, sort of the health of your brain cells. We have experimental PET scans, like Dr. Benlin is doing, looking at synapse density, synapse being the connections between brain cells. Very exciting. On the upper right, you see lumbar punctures, which are a really important part of our program. This is how we collect spinal fluid, the fluid that bathes the brain. And with that fluid, we can study many different things, many different proteins. And you see here a picture of Dr. Carlson, who's coming on next, and she's an excellent clinician who, who can do this procedure. We have others that are, that are here today as well. But some of the biomarkers I've mentioned here are not specific to Alzheimer's. They're very important. But the ones when we think of biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, that's amyloid and that's tau. So why are blood-based biomarkers a good thing? Why is this something that matters in our field? And I think the most important thing is access. In order for us, or in order for you to get a lumbar puncture, to do an MRI or do a PET scan, you have to come to us. You have to come to downtown Madison, Wisconsin, into the hospital so that we can do these things. And I'm appreciative that many of you are willing to do it and that our participants do it. But that is prohibitive to some people. Some people aren't able to make hour-long drives or they aren't comfortable with the procedure itself. And so that, that piece of it is, is preventing us from being able to study all people, which is the goal. And Dr. Astana mentioned, we want a diverse sample. We want to know what Alzheimer's disease or aging looks like in all people. So access will ultimately lead to better representation. 
Hopefully we'll get rural populations, we'll get smaller populations, small city populations, and we'll reach communities of color who historically have been more hesitant or concerned about some of the procedures that we're doing. The next thing is it's less invasive and there's less risk. Blood draws are a fairly common thing. Um, it's, it's not that invasive, although it, it can hurt at times, but it certainly has low risk to it. I will say that our lumbar punctures also have low risk, but certainly it's a little bit higher. It's also cost effective and time effective to do a blood draw. Cost effective, it's not as expensive as a, a very expensive PET scan or a lumbar puncture. And time effective, it's, it's easier to schedule a blood draw, it's easier to draw blood. These are shorter visits, it's easier to process. And these two factors alone mean it's scalable. And what I mean by scalable is that we can get more people, again, increase access and availability. And by doing that, we have more people, more participants, more data. And more data does mean more reliable results, more accurate results, and more meaningful results, hopefully. And lastly, blood, like spinal fluid, can be collected and stored, and that is what we do. So we're talking about certain blood-based biomarkers right now, but two years from now, three years from now, scientists might have developed newer techniques, newer proteins to look at, and they can go back and study those changes over time. So it's a really important resource for them. So then what are the current blood-based biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease research? And of course, amyloid, as Dr. Barzi mentioned, amyloid is a really critical one. It's the first abnormal protein in Alzheimer's disease. At least that's how we define it, amyloid and then tau. So amyloid can be identified with a blood-based biomarker. There's different versions of it or different lengths, and so we use a ratio of amyloid beta 42 over 40. You're gonna hear me say that a lot going forward. But there's also something called phosphorylated tau, or p-tau. And that's a tau protein, so that's what I mean when I say amyloid and tau, it's the second one, but it's modified because of the presence of amyloid, and so it's very important. And then you have other proteins like NFL, T tau, and GFAP, and I'll explain what all of those are in just a few seconds. But again, as Dr. Johnson, Sterling Johnson said to me multiple times, the biomarkers of Alzheimer's are amyloid and P tau. And so when we look at those, just those in particular, P tau does seem to be the best right now. And P tau 217, really does seem to show elevated levels indicate positive amyloid PET scans. Really high levels of P-tau-217 indicate tau PET positivity, which is pretty incredible. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I would encourage you to Google this RAP publication, Plasma P-tau-217 in Preclinical Alzheimer's Disease. You can find it, it's available to the public. Now I have an asterisk next to my next point, which is that this is a little bit more complicated than I'm saying. There's many variations of P-tau. P tau 181, 217, 231, it just goes on. And these are just different formulations or, or variations of the structure. So that matters, what we're studying, which one we're studying matters. But so is the molecule that we're using to identify that protein, as well as the system or the platform we're using to analyze it. So you can see there's a lot of different variables here. And when you add all of that up, there is going to be some variability and some noise. And so over time, we will narrow it down to which is the best one. And certainly, we feel like we're working with the groups that are doing that. In addition to P-tau, we have that A-beta 42 over 40. This is also being used in clinic, or being used in research, but it's also used in clinic. And I think that's the, the unique aspect of it. It's being used in, at St. Louis. So your physician could refer that if you have mild cognitive impairment or dementia. There's a couple of prohibitive parts to this, and that's that it's expensive, so it's not covered by insurance, and it costs roughly $1,400. The other fact, is that there's a 20%, roughly, maybe a little bit less, uh, false positive rate, so 20%. Now, every test has a false positive rate, and this is still considered to be within reason and, and accepted, which is why it was approved. But for some people, that might not be enough. That being said, it's still a reliable test that, that we are using, uh, both, not our institution right now, but both in clinics and in research. Now the other proteins I mentioned, neurofilament light, NFL, that is a nonspecific protein that we can get from the blood that reflects neurodegeneration, breakdown of, of brain cells. Total tau is again nonspecific, but looking at neuronal injury. And then glial fibrillary acidic protein. Now you can see why I call it GFAP. GFAP is nonspecific for brain inflammation. So these all have a place in the work that we're doing. These three, last three just aren't specific to Alzheimer's disease. So then are the proteins that we measure in the blood, particularly the amyloid and the P-tau, are these the same as the ones that we're looking at in the CSF and in PET scans? 
And the answer to that is yes. So proteins start in the brain, and Dr. Barzi had mentioned that, and they go through the blood-brain barrier. It's not as, as um, impermeable as we have thought. And then it's cleared out through the blood. So as you can see in the figure here, I'm not sure. So I don't have my mouse, but the, the middle part of this figure is where the proteins are made. They cross through the blood, and then they're, they're passed on. And that's important because there's a lot of blood vessels in the brain. Blood vessel health is very important, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or a vascular disease that's causing a person's changes. And eventually it leaves the brain, it leaves the face, the neck, and goes into the rest of the body. So it makes sense that we could collect that with a blood draw through the arm. Eventually, these proteins are going to be cleared through the kidneys and the liver. So then how valid are these blood-based biomarkers? And this is probably one of the most important slides I'm going to show, because this is really the point of the research. It is our job to develop these techniques to measure, to, to help understand human disease. But it's, we, we have to show that these tests are actually measuring the things we say they're measuring. Is this really the protein? that we're measuring. So it's the, the validity of that is really the key part of it. So are these tests measuring what they're supposed to measure? And are they doing it in the different populations? And what I mean by different populations is whether it is your race, your gender, your age, your cognitive ability, or your other health statuses. These are really important. And then it's important to understand how does this blood-based biomarker relate to the things that we're looking at, whether it's time course or disease mechanism or outcomes like cognition. So we have to do that in research to make sure that these things are valid. And many of the studies right now are showing validity of this A beta 42 over 40 and P tau. Now, something we have to keep in mind is that we're using these PET scans as the gold standard, and that makes sense. The ultimate gold standard is brain tissue, but we're not willing to wait for people to pass away in order to help people. So we have to use these PET scans, and that's still a good thing to do. It just limits some of the accuracy that we can speak to. It is being studied across all age groups and cognitive abilities, but the one thing that we're still not doing enough of is it's mostly studied in well-to-do, well-educated, white individuals. And so we need to have that diverse population to make sure that these tests are actually accurate in all people from all races, all ethnicities, and all backgrounds. And our institution is certainly dedicated and prioritizing to make sure that that can happen. Now this is going to be the only figure or scientific slide that I show you, and I want to thank Dr. Johnson for this and the RAP team. But the left square here you're gonna see a bunch of dots. All these dots represent research participants who have given blood and undergone amyloid PET scans. Now the left column represents people who are negative on their amyloid PET scan. But, and you can see that the blood level, so this is the vertical axis, the blood level shows very low levels of this P tau 217, which really suggests a nice relationship between low P tau 217 and being negative on an amyloid PET scan. Now the right column, still this left square, or left rectangle, shows people who are positive on their amyloid PET scan. And you can see there are more of these blood values that are higher. Again, showing a nice relationship of elevated P tau 217 and being positive on an amyloid PET scan. There's still some overlap, as you can see, kind of in the middle. And so it's not a perfect test, but depending on where you put your cutoff, it can be really helpful. It's the same concept for the right square. So the right square now is showing tau PET, so that left column is showing negative tau PET and then low levels of that blood test, P tau 217. Again, a nice relationship. And then the right column showing elevated levels. And you can see really high levels of this P tau 217 has a nice correlation to being positive on a tau PET. So I wanna stop right here and thank the research participants who have come in and given blood and done PET scans. Because without that work, without the participation, we wouldn't be able to do this. We would not be contributing to the cutting edge field of blood-based biomarkers. I also want to make a plea of if you haven't done this, we really do need more. We need people to be able to come in, do our visits, which aren't that bad. I think you've seen some very nice people here today. <laughs> Give blood and do a PET scan or a lumbar puncture so that we can validate these blood-based biomarkers and show that they are useful and meaningful use them in research, and then ultimately be able to use them in clinic. So can a blood-based biomarker diagnose mild cognitive impairment or dementia? And I bolded this one to show some emphasis, no. And so I'm not being territorial as a clinician, I promise. But MCI and dementia, these are clinical diagnoses. 
This requires symptoms, history, a person's experience, cognitive testing, and a very thorough evaluation. That cannot be encapsulated or minimized to a blood test. Certainly blood tests can be helpful, but a person's experience should never be minimized. And so this diagnosis will remain in a clinic, but it will certainly be helped by blood-based biomarkers. And if you've already been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or dementia, can the blood-based biomarker help you diagnose the cause of it as Alzheimer's disease? And in this regard, I would say yes, but it depends. The clinical history and the testing still matter, but also the type of biomarker that we're talking about still matters. If we're gonna talk about NFL or TTAL or GFAP looking at inflammation or neurodegeneration, no, because those aren't specific to Alzheimer's disease. But the amyloid and the PTAL, well, that could support a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. It can't speak to the other things, vascular disease, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body disease, uh, frontal temporal or TDP43. All those things can happen too, and oftentimes we do see multiple causes, but certainly a beta 42 over 40 and PTAL could talk about Alzheimer's. And so for instance, if your A beta 42 over 40 blood tests were to show, indicate elevated amyloid, it would not speak to tau, but that would be strongly suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. As we think of Alzheimer's biologically, it's the presence of amyloid and tau. So you wanna have both of those. And A beta 42 over 40 can't really speak to tau, but it certainly supports it, more so than I can do in clinic and if I had that test, I would feel comfortable telling my patient, this, is, this certainly looks like Alzheimer's disease in the right clinical context. Now, PTAL217 is a little bit different. Elevated levels can show elevated amyloid, but really high levels can show elevated tau. And so that's sort of two for one. And in this regard, this might actually be then the biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. This test isn't available in clinic yet, but you can see the excitement that a clinician might have in knowing that we may be able to actually provide our patients definitive answers to the things that they're asking. So can blood-based biomarkers predict who's going to develop future cognitive symptoms? And the answer to that is possibly. Now, similar to PET scans, there is a relationship between these blood-based biomarkers, some of them, and future cognitive change. So some blood-based markers show that association. And in fact, our institution is one of them that has shown at least in one study, and thanks to Drs. Gleason and Johnson, we've had 179 African-American participants who have gone through multiple research visits and done cognitive testing with us and donated their blood so that it can be studied. And we have shown that some blood-based biomarker, this A-beta 42 over 40, does have a relationship to future cognitive changes on testing. These are healthy individuals, they may or may not have had symptoms, but there did seem to be a relationship. That's powerful information. But we need more studies like that to really validate it. In other communities, just more numbers in general to make sure that this is real. So can blood-based biomarkers predict who will develop the changes of Alzheimer's disease in the brain or actual cognitive impairment, MCI and dementia? And again, possibly. So one thing we have to keep in mind is not everyone with amyloid will develop tau. That's an important concept. So some biomarkers may help differentiate who with amyloid is going to progress and who may not. We're still working on that. But again, context matters. So one of our colleagues, Dr. Oscar Hansen in Europe, is showing that people with mild cognitive impairment that have amyloid, but also have a different biomarker, that GFAP, that, that marker of inflammation, that may be helpful in predicting who converts from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. So more is needed on that to work that out, but there certainly are studies. The other thing is not everyone with amyloid and tau, the changes of Alzheimer's disease, actually develop symptoms or dementia. And that's an important part. There's, there's still uncertainty there. And so amyloid can be present in the brain for 20 to 30 years. And so it's likely not the best biomarker to talk to us about symptoms. But tau, on the other hand, is closer related to symptoms. And so maybe amyloid and tau or some other biomarkers as a collection or a composite may be helpful in doing that. Ultimately, we are gonna have more greater predictive power as the accuracy of these tests improve and the diversity of the tests improve so that we're having multiple different things and not just amyloid and tau, maybe neuroinflammation, blood-brain barrier integrity, oxidative stress, the, the list can go on. These scientists think of so many things. So the more we know of this, maybe that power will allow us to be able to make those predictions. And then lastly, can blood-based biomarkers improve clinical trials? And I bolded this one too, yes. And that's really exciting, it's really important. And this is some of the work that Dr. Carlson is doing. 
What we see now is that A-beta 42 over 40 and P-tau can be used to screen individuals in pharmaceutical studies for drug trials. And that's important because it reduces the number of people needed in order to screen for the right population so that we can start drug therapies. So that's time effective, that's cost effective, and that reduces the burden on people who wish to participate. Because if you don't have what they're looking for, then you don't have to go through a lumbar puncture or a PET scan, which are still being used definitively. And ideally, if a blood-based biomarker could replace a lumbar puncture or a PET scan, well then the, these studies are gonna be much more efficient, effective, and they can hopefully return results to us even sooner. The other exciting part about this in clinical trials is that we can use blood-based biomarkers to monitor progression in drug therapies. So many of these new drug therapies, lecanemab, aducanemab, there's other ones called denanemab, these are, going, these are attaching to amyloid proteins in the brain and they're being removed. And so we need to know that that's actually effective and happening. And so a blood-based biomarker would be helpful in showing once positive, now negative, and that you continue to not have amyloid over time. Or if you do develop amyloid over time, that we can see that. And if by using a blood-based biomarker, we're now allowing these trials to, do, to have more people in it and, and really prevent the need for lumbar punctures and PET scans, which are both expensive and timely. This is already happening in the Trailblazer All study, and that's using the drug denanemab, but it's happening in other studies too. So there's great potential here, and it's already being used. So then going back to our cases, our hypothetical situations. So Minnie wants to know, can this blood-based biomarker tell her if that dementia is due to Alzheimer's disease? And so that I would say yes, under the right circumstances, that we would be able to do that, certainly with the newer ones that I anticipate will be coming out in the next couple of years. Now Mickey, on the other hand, wants to know, will the blood-based biomarker tell him if he has dementia? And the answer to that is no. We need a clinical evaluation for that. We need to know what he's experiencing. However, if he wants to know if he's going to develop dementia, well, we're working on that. That is something that may happen in the future. And for Donald, who's a healthy person with lots of questions about his future, again, the field is moving in that direction. There's a lot of predictive power to some of these blood tests in the right context, with the right histories, and the right people doing it to make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. There's a lot of ethical questions here, too, which is what our center is also working on. So if you're interested in what we're doing at our center, the idea of biomarkers, the ethics of the, of the disclosure of biomarkers, I would encourage you, as Dr. Walsek has nicely done for me, to, to download uh, the episodes of Dementia Matters. We have well over 120. They're all still relevant. And, so, and, and I'm happy to, to answer any of your questions at the end of this. But thank you for your time. Well, what a terrific review of some incredibly cutting edge stuff. So thank you very much, Dr. Chin. Uh, now on to our final presenter of the evening. Uh, I'm incredibly honored and delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Cindy Carlson. Uh, so Dr. Carlson is a leader within the ADRC. She's also the director of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute which makes her my boss. Sanjay's my boss too. I have plenty of bosses in this room. Uh, and so I'll be nice and respectful to you, Dr. Carlson, as my boss. Uh, she's a national leader, so she is the chair of a federal advisory panel uh, that uh, uh, advises the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on Alzheimer's disease. She's a state leader. She helps uh, run our dementia state plan program. And she's a clinician uh, taking care of veterans, so a number of uh, really significant roles locally, regionally, and nationally, and are delighted to hear Dr. Carlson talk about cardiovascular health and uh, memory. Thank you. Um, so again, I'm so glad to be here. It's been so long since we've all been together in the room, and it's so good to see so many familiar faces who've known over decades, and it's been such a great partnership with so many of you in our studies, and this is a lot of the work we're doing here and presenting is the work that many of you have contributed to. And I think this room being full also shows us we have a lot of questions, there have been a lot of breakthroughs and exciting things happening in Alzheimer's research in the last three years. And so um, I wanna make sure we get time for all your questions. So three years with the questions that we're gonna hopefully answer the half an hour at the end here. So i um, thrilled to have you here. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about know your numbers for cardiovascular and brain health. Um, but I wanna ask first, how many people in the room before we get started actually know your numbers? How many people know Pretty much all these numbers here. 
Good for you. That's good. That's good. I had to think through before I gave this. I'm like, do I know all line numbers? I should. So, um, so again, why I'm going to start with this and end with this is I think a lot of times, you know, when we are waiting for breakthrough therapies for Alzheimer's disease, it feels a little bit helpless. We're just waiting for this disease to come. But I think like Dr. Barzi mentioned, and hopefully you'll see today, that there are things we can do right now to help protect our brains. It's not the only thing, but again, Alzheimer's is complicated, and the more we can do by getting good rest, taking care of ourselves, and addressing some factors that are, are modifiable, we can change these, um, it, it does all make a difference and contribute to our better brain health. So we'll get back to these numbers in a little bit. So I think this is a familiar um, picture for us that, again, the the um, number of people with Alzheimer's disease is increasing. We're living longer, which is great, um, but then that means because age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, um, more of us are getting Alzheimer's disease. So this graph shows us that the blue line, which are um, people who are 85 and older, are really driving, because we're living longer, driving that increase in, um, in risk of Alzheimer's, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. But as we get older, if we think about other things, you know, those of us who are aging, all of us in this room, as we get older, you know, we also have more common things like high blood pressure and maybe some cholesterol problems and some other health factors. So that accumulation of those things also affects our brain health. Just like Dr. Barzi talked about, you know, sleep and other things kind of have their long-term effect on our brain. So as we get older, um, we're more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. There are different risks based on our racial and ethnic background, which may in part be due to vascular risk factors, other social determinants of health, and other things that we're realizing affect our health overall. So again, as we think about what are the things that we can do to help protect our brain, a lot of these things are things that uh, happen to us over time that we can make a difference in. So these are some of the risk factors that we're aware of for Alzheimer's disease. So these are things, um, obviously, we can't do anything about. So aging, as I mentioned, is the number one risk factor. If we have a family history of dementia, so I think a lot of us who are part of the program, either staff, faculty, or participants um, in our center have family history of Alzheimer's. That's why we're doing this, so like myself as well. Um, there's a genetic risk factor, APOE4 allele. Um, that also increases our risk. But then there's other things too. So these vascular risk factors um, are all associated with increased risk of getting dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And these are things we can do something about. So th these data are, are shown that, that show us that these risk factors accumulate over time. So um, today when we talk about know your numbers, we're gonna talk about just kind of being comfortable with ones, I think just figuring out what are the, what are the things we can do something about, something that's manageable we can focus on. This study though, um, led by Dr. Rachel Whitmer, who was a speaker, um, I went to our talks a while ago, pre-COVID, in person. Um, but again, you can see that they, what they did is they study the combination of hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and smoking, and they looked to see what is your risk for getting dementia if you add those up over time. And so on the boxes on the left, if you have, you know, zero is um, a baseline risk, so it goes to one, but you can see as you accumulate these vascular risks, your risk of getting a dementia increases. So it's really two and a half times or so by the time you get four risk factors, four vascular risk factors. So again, this is not insignificant, and so there have been some estimates that quite a bit of our risk for dementia may be from these vascular risk factors, which is something we can do something about. So when we think about the types, then it gets a little confusing, because then if we have dementia from Alzheimer's, is that vascular dementia or is that different? And so these are the common causes of dementia that you'll see listed. Um, so Alzheimer's disease, um, one called Lewy body disease, where people tend to have, they may have visual hallucinations or a tremor, um, falls. There's other type of vascular dementia, which we'll talk about. Um, frontotemporal dementia, which tends to come on earlier, um, tends to have either strong behavioral changes or else strong language changes early on. And then Parkinson's disease dementia, where somebody may have Parkinson's symptoms, motor symptoms slowing down for about six, eight years, and then get some cognitive changes. So you can see here that Alzheimer's, it says, where it says AD alone, is by far the most common type. But we're seeing more and more that there's a combination. Usually Alzheimer's is combined with something else. And a lot of times it's vascular. So they kind of work in parallel to kind of make that progression go faster. So even if somebody has Alzheimer's, if we can get rid of that other contributing factor, it may help our thinking abilities stay stronger longer. 
when we look at the brain of somebody, let's see if I can use the, I don't think the mouse shows up, no. So on the left-hand side is a front section through our brain as if you're looking straight on somebody's head. And the same on the right. The person on the left does not have Alzheimer's disease and the person on the right does. So in the top picture, um, you can see is kind of a schematic of what you're seeing on this MRI scan down here. And you can see that in the person who's healthy compared to the person who has Alzheimer's disease, um, they're, they're tissue is plumper and fuller, and then once you get Alzheimer's disease, there's some shrinkage there. You can also see, which I'll talk about in a little bit, there's like a brownish ribbon on the outside, and that's where a lot of the brain cells are, and the whitish part in the middle is where all these connection tracks are, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So if you look up close at the part where the, the cells are, that's where you see the neurons or nerve cells in the brain, and they're kind of resting in, in healthy tissue here. If you look at people who have Alzheimer's disease, you'll see um, the nerve cells have um, build up around them of the amyloid plaque, and that's what Dr. Chin was talking about, these amyloid markers. And then within the nerve cells, you'll see that there's um, build up of something called tau, forming these tangles. And so those two are the two features that, again, were mentioned as far as part of the biomarkers. So these are the typical changes in Alzheimer's disease. So in vascular dementia, it's a little different picture, though. So in vascular dementia, someone will have some blockages of their blood vessels, and it'll cause a stroke. And they'll have symptoms, and you'll see it on a scan. You can see that on the scans, here they have these big whitish areas where the tissue's been damaged from not getting good blood flow. So again, it seems like there's a little bit of discord. You know, the, the brain scan of the person with Alzheimer's disease looked like it was just kind of gradually shrinking over time, whereas this brain scan looks like there's a, a pocket that's not um, getting, getting enough blood flow. But there are common things that contribute to Alzheimer's disease that kind of affect both of these types of dementias. So here's this picture again. This is, again, a shot as if you're looking down from on top of the head, but again, showing those same plaques and tangles in the, the picture down below. And um, what this picture shows off to the right then is kind of a close-up of those nerve cells, and then on the outside of the nerve cells, they have a long trail, and then they have this thing called a myelin sheath, which is like coating. It's kind of, I was like, compare it's like the coating on electrical wires, kind of. So um, that coating, um, again, protects it so you can have the, the, connect, the nerve signals go through the connection wires or the neurons so that they can communicate with each other. So if that white coating, has anyone, I just talked today to a colleague who had a mouse nibble through something. So if you have a mouse nibble through the white coating, and, and if there's electricians in the room, I'm sorry, I'm not using the right term, whatever. It's got an official name, I'm sure. Um, but <laughs> the white coating, if that's damaged by blood vessel damage or things over time, then those connection tracks don't work as well. And so um, our colleague, Dr. Benlin, does a lot of work on studying those connection tracks in the brain, so those white matter areas, and then the gray matter as well, which is the nerve cells. So in Alzheimer's disease, we also know that there's a buildup of amyloid, and it can affect um, the, line, the blood vessels themselves. And so it can cause some buildup of amyloid in the blood vessels, and it can cause weakening of the blood vessels, and then it makes people at risk for these little microhemorrhages or microbleeds there as well. And so that's important when we talk about these new medicines coming out, these like lecanemab, aducanemab, which I'm sure or I hope a lot of you have questions on. So what other ways do vascular risk factors contribute to dementia? So there's a lot of different ways. So one is it reduces the blood flow, and I'll show you a picture from our study team in a minute. It weakens the artery walls, like I just mentioned, some of the amyloid buildup. It reduces our brain's ability to kind of clear out the toxins, and so that kind of ties in with what Dr. Barzi was talking about, about the brain resting, kind of helping to clear out the toxins from our brain. Um, we've talked about how you can have little strokes, that, that blockages of the blood vessels. And then, again, just not being able to clear out the, you're not being able to be, bring good oxygen or clear out that amyloid buildup is um, probably another way that vascular con factors contribute to Alzheimer's risk. So these are data from um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Leonardo Rivera, Rivera who um, showed in this with some really unique um, blood flow scans that were developed here at University of Wisconsin. And what this shows is on the bottom left that shows some three-dimensional pictures of the blood that you can see, the blood flow in the brain. The graph to the right 
The black bars are people who already have Alzheimer's disease, and the lighter the colors they are, the less cognitive impairment they have. So again, people who have Alzheimer's, um, the second gray bar is mild cognitive impairment, and then um, cognitively healthy older adult, and then cognitively healthy middle-aged adult. And you can see that the blood flow is less in people who have Alzheimer's disease. And then people who have healthier, um, who have healthier thinking abilities have healthier levels of the blood flow. So again, this is just evidence and a way for us to measure that blood flow in the brain can be measured in people who have Alzheimer's disease, and there's some relationship there between blood flow and Alzheimer's. So what we really care about is can we treat these blood vessel risk factors and is it going to help us? It's going to help us to think more clearly. And so there have been some studies that are starting to look, and actually quite a few studies that have been looking at um, if we treat these blood vessel risk factors, uh, does it make a difference? And so I had a slide before that has a lot of just busy things. The main bottom line is that there is some evidence, especially for high blood pressure. If we control our blood pressure, which a lot of us have, it gets more common the older we get, if we control our blood pressure, it really makes a difference in our risk for getting dementia down the road. There's also good evidence for um, something called the Mediterranean diet, which has been modified by a scientist um, from Chicago, Martha Claire Morris, who was a speaker um, years ago here for our program and unfortunately passed away um, in the last several years. But she did great work um, combining it for the mind diet, so some dietary changes that can make a difference. Um, but we do need some other studies. There's also some studies on statin drugs that are, that are promising. So again, there's a lot of evidence. The best evidence right now is for controlling our blood pressure. And so what's being done is there are a lot of studies that look at what we call drug repurposing, where they try to see, well, this is approved for blood pressure, but can it make a difference in how much amyloid I have in my brain? And so we're doing a lot of those studies at University of Wisconsin. This is, um, if I had to pick my favorite study of the last 10 years, this is probably my favorite study. So I just made that up, but, anyway, it, but I'm, I'm serious. So the Sprint Mind study had people who had um, uh, average blood pressure, pretty unremarkable, I mean about 130 over, um, you know, 130 for the top number. And so then what they did is they tried to treat them to um, see if controlling blood pressure better helped prevent onset of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And so they, they titrated different blood pressure medicines. So a thiazide diuretic is one like hydrochlorothiazide, some of you may be on. Um, and then they combined it with an ACE inhibitor, which is a type of medicine like lisinopril or um, one of those pril medicines, and then a calcium channel blocker. So they gave people a combination, but were really focused on lowering their blood pressure. And they found that um, new cases of mild cognitive impairment were reduced by about 19% compared to those who weren't didn't have as good a blood pressure control. So some people say, well, it was a combination, like the mild cognitive impairment and dementia, but they didn't reduce dementia risk. But this is so far, has, and there's been a lot of other data that's promising for um, controlling blood pressure, reducing risk of developing dementia. So that's my take home point, control your blood pressure. So I know a lot of people say, wait, I've been on blood pressure medicine for decades, or I've been a statin for decades, and, or my parents were on this, and they still got dementia. It, it's true. It's not going to be the only, the only factor in what con contributes to us developing an Alzheimer's disease. But if you think about it, um, you know, for me, if, we have, if I had five more years of good thinking abilities, that would mean a lot to me. So even if it delays the onset by five years, it could be a lot of memories there. So if you think about um, this picture here shows just the accumulating Alzheimer's disease brain changes, so the amyloid plaques and tangles. Um, if you see the black line up top, that's kind of what happens when we age normally. The red lines, if we get mild cognitive impairment and dementia. But if you think about it, if we can shift that over, again, delaying that onset could be really meaningful. You know, I think about this year we had, I had, Three of, my, three of my three sons graduated, big graduations. It was all within a month period. And just thinking back, you know, I'm so glad I have those memories there. And if I, you know, if I had, was at the risk of getting dementia and had gotten symptoms before versus after, you know, again, all of us have these stories about these really important times in our lives. And sometimes it doesn't line up well. But again, having five more years of good thinking abilities can be really meaningful. So what's the future? So a lot of us think, oh, it would be great if we could have a, um, you know, a, a way to diagnose and pinpoint exactly our risk. So let's say we had a person um, come in. A, this is my 
father. Um, so let's say he was a young 78-year-old, came in, his mom had Alzheimer's disease, she got it in her early 70s, and she, he went to go see his physician, and she looked at his vascular risk profile and said, well, your blood pressure's a little high, your hemoglobin was, he looks okay, LDL's okay, your body mass index is in the obese category, you're sedentary, let's think about what your Alzheimer's risk is, you know, maybe he would have a, a PET scan like the ones Dr. Chin mentioned, maybe a spinal fluid test or some other kind of risk profiling, and then ha reduce his risk. Um, let's say it could reduce it then from, you know, 50% down to 17% with some of these changes. So we're working toward that. We don't have all the answers yet, but again, it's going to probably be different for each person. How much is blood pressure contributing versus my genetics, et cetera? So we have several study. We have quite a few studies, but I would go to our website. I'm just going to mention two. Um, again, we have uh, studies. Well, this one's being done in veterans. This is nearing completion, looking at um, medications that are used to treat um, high triglycerides in the blood or high cholesterol. Again, looking at brain blood flow. There are other studies being done nationally, internationally, um, here at our site as well, um, that look at how can we do multiple things, improve our thinking abilities and do exercise and that combination and, and improve those factors to see if we can reduce our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But if we break it down, again, there's, there's, if we think through, again, like what Dr. Barzi recommended for us to improve our sleep, there are things we can do. And this is one approach about life simple seven, um, but I'm going to skip forward because four is easier than seven, because four is less than seven, because I'm good at math. So, so I'm going to come back to know our numbers. So again, I think if, if there is a take home message, especially for the, the second one, again, the numbers that are shown here are probably going to be a little bit different than for each person because it depends on if you have diabetes or other factors as well. So you should talk with your physician about um, these factors and what your numbers should be. But again, if everyone got to know what your, cholesterol, your blood glucose, that first one is, your blood pressure, your blood cholesterol, and then your body mass index, um, that would be um, a great first start. So for body mass index, um, I, I was going to tease that we all have um, little uh, tapes underneath because can, you can also measure your waistline. Everyone get out a tape and measure your waistline, which no one would want to do. But again, these are things, these are just health factors. So for us to know these four numbers, especially I'm going to say number two, and really try to work on that as a single goal, in addition, actually if you sleep better, your blood pressure will come down too, right? And then, so everything together. So um, what else can you do? Join one of our studies. We'll never have answers to any of these questions without um, research participants. Um, so again, I think there's a lot we can do while we're waiting for the breakthrough therapies, which I'm sure people have questions about, but um, we can know our numbers and make some promise there. So thank you. All right, well, I want to thank our incredible speakers uh, tonight. What, what wonderful information we've gotten tonight. And now's your chance to engage with our speakers. Uh, so please fill out those question and answer cards. Our staff are going around picking those up. And here's that yellow form I was talking about. This is that evaluation form. So please pull those out and fill these out as well. And we'll be collecting these. Your feedback is super important to us. So I'm going to invite our, all of our speakers to come on up for our panel discussion, and uh, we'll start sending some questions their way. For what time you go to bed at night, as long as it's part of a routine and, last, and sleep lasts seven to eight hours, so the time matter. Great question. Um, what I would say is that there is actually a, um, built into all of us, our genes, a certain type of a, what we call a chronotype. So you know, every, how many of you in the room are, are the night owls? Like to stay up late, and, oh yeah. And then how many of you are the larks? You get up early in the morning, get things done, okay. So the idea is if you're a, a night owl, but you're trying to go to bed really early and get up really early, there is some rebellion. Our body doesn't like that. So if you understand kind of what your natural rhythm is, and then you align with the, a certain consistent time that's close to that rhythm, that's probably the best arrangement. Thank you. Looks like there's a question there directed towards Dr. Bendlin and Chin. So for the um, 
dementia care partner uh, research project, do the caregivers need to be in Wisconsin? And the answer is no. You can also live elsewhere. My question. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? I'll just talk real close to this microphone. Uh, my question is, how do you ensure that blood-based biomarkers cannot be used to exclude a person from insurance or health insurance? And that's an incredibly important question, and one that we think about for all of our biomarkers, PET scans, lumbar punctures, and that is that we have a very strict IRB and we have a very strong security system to keep research data as research. And so that is not shared uh, with healthcare or with insurance. They cannot request that through, um, and, and we just give that. that the university is very, um, very strongly supports protecting data. Otherwise, people wouldn't volunteer. It's a really important question and one that should always be asked, but our institution is very strong in making sure data does not leave the university without permission, even including other research studies. What if you get it from your doctor? Oh, that's an excellent question. So if you were, you mean if you were to get the blood test from your mm -hmm. doctor. So if you get the blood test, anything in clinic is accessible by insurance companies. Insurance can request medical records, uh, progress notes from your healthcare providers. And so that would be potentially uh, used by insurance companies for whatever reason. This is exactly the, the reason why in research we say to our participants, uh, you have the right to not share any information with your clinician when it comes to biomarkers. You don't have to, but if you do, and that clinician documents it, that is in a medical legal record, and that's really important for people to understand. Thank you. We have another great question about risk factors, and it just so happens we have someone with an endocrinology background who's an expert in estrogen, and that's Dr. Astana. So the question for him is, what is the current status of estrogen replacement for postmenopausal women and the relationship with dementia? You can hear me now, right? Very important question. Uh, so uh, we know from decades of research that as menopause uh, approaches, the uh, hormone levels, especially estrogen and other hormones decline, and that has some bearing in connection with decline in cognitive skills. And in some studies, not all, perhaps some increased risk for uh, dementia. Uh, there was a very popular study called Women's Health Initiative done now maybe about 15 plus 20 years ago. Any, any one of you who were in that study? No one here, okay. So that study involved estrogen treatment, which was Premarin, um, and it has another uh, one form of estrogen, and the estrogen patch has another form of estrogen. So in the Women's Health Initiative or WHI study, they use oral Premarin, um, and after about five plus years of intervention, they stopped the study. It was done nationally because they found that Premarin increased the risk for dementia. And that really caused a stir. As you can imagine, at that time, estrogen was being prescribed often to manage postmenopausal symptoms. When Women's Health Initiative come out with, this, with, this, with these findings, the prescription for estrogen really declined. The more recent studies did not confirm, they were smaller in size compared to WHI, they did not confirm that estrogen, uh, Premarin rather, uh, reduced uh, your cognitive function and increased the risk for Alzheimer's. So that's not been confirmed in smaller mm -hmm. studies. Right now, uh, estrogen is not used to prevent Alzheimer's disease or decrease your risk. Uh, it is primarily to manage menopausal symptoms and the recommendation is to give it for about two, three, four years. And long-term estrogen treatment is, is more or less out of practice due to other side effects like clots in your, lung, in, your, in your lungs, in your leg, and some other side effects. So it is not given on a long-term basis. And there's no relationship that it will reduce your risk for dementia. Thank you. 
Here's a question for Dr. Carlson. This has to do with BMI and kind of normal BMI ranges. And wondering, does, does that normal BMI range apply to everyone? For example, men versus women, different racial and ethnic groups or cultural backgrounds. Is there some variability in terms of what we consider a normal BMI, blood, body mass index? Um, so it does look like there are some changes where they do have different um, BMI ranges for Asian American Asians compared to non-Asian. Um, non um, I don't know if there's other changes, but it's just minor shifts. And so I think the main thing with BMI, um, what's common is that if you looked at BMI when we we're in our 50s and then our risk for dementia versus if you look at your BMI right before you get dementia, we tend to lose weight right before we get dementia. So then it would look like having low weight looks like you're higher risk for getting a dementia. But it has to do with the risk factors over time and then what happens to your body beforehand. So. Overall, um, and again, right now, we don't have parameters to necessarily prevent dementia, but we have parameters to prevent cardiovascular disease. So I would never recommend, um, you know, get, there's so many good reasons to keep those numbers under good control um, for cardiovascular disease. Again, we're just starting to see data for the um, blood pressure to help prevent Alzheimer's disease, but again, I would really focus on that. Um, again, every step is better though, so if you can't get into that normal range, then try to get you know, get the BMI down a few points, you know, set some reasonable goals, um, start, you know, I've, I've worked on my own goals within those two. I think we all have us have to pick something that's feasible and just start there. Thank you. Okay. It's the time of the evening we talk about cannabis. Uh, so, <laughs> Dr. Barzi, your thoughts on THC or CBD gummies to help to fall asleep and stay asleep? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> so um, a lot of times we like to guide our, uh, make our recommendations based on uh, scientific evidence. And as you all know, the availability of these kinds of substances in our culture has changed a lot in the last, say, five or 10 years. Um, and you know what we know is that um, the, there are some suggestion that some of these substances can help in some kinds of emotional states. Um, and some people will uh, attest to the fact that it helps to calm them. Um, however, uh, if we're really talking based on evidence right now, um, it's awful hard to, to suggest that those therapies should be used for sleep. I will say that in my geriatric sleep practice and my adult sleep practice, I have people who say that they really have noticed a difference in how they feel, but that's, that's own, their own individual experience. Um, so um, I, right now, if we go strictly by what's the evidence show, uh, I cannot endorse those kinds of therapies for sleep purposes alone. Um, but maybe in the, in the next five years, we'll have some research or evidence that actually supports that. Right now, um, I would just say that there's a lot of personal experiences and people out there who say yes and say no to this, um, but uh, I'm afraid I can't give you more information. And just a, a follow-up, so uh, recently there's been some, some news about maybe melatonin being overused by, by folks, and we do have a question from the audience about that. What, what's your sense about appropriate use of melatonin with respect to sleep? Yeah, so melatonin's a hormone all of our bodies make, and it's made in the evening time and uh, in advance of uh, when we go to sleep. Um, most people, even when we get older, still have normal melatonin rhythms. It's kind of like, remember I said circadian rhythms? Well, melatonin has circadian rhythm just like other things. And so we see some ups and we see some downs during the course of the day. Um, most people, will probably not notice a big difference if they use melatonin for sleep alone. Where melatonin's a very powerful hormone is for shifting that clock. Remember I talked about the clock? So it's more powerful for, in, for shifting the clock. Um, overuse of melatonin, it's become a really easy therapy for people to try. Almost every doctor under the sun will say, try some melatonin, see if it helps. Um, but anyway, so my point is there are some people who don't make enough melatonin, and that small subset of the population can really benefit. The problem is we don't have a really good blood test 
to measure to say you're a low melatonin person, you're a high melatonin person. So that's where it gets tricky. Um, because it's safe, as long as you don't go overboard, I will have some of my patients try it, but I say if you haven't seen a benefit in a month, you're not probably gonna see a benefit. Um, ironically, more is not better with melatonin. Uh, most, it turns out that lower doses of melatonin come closer to our normal body's secretion level. And so, in fact, for purposes of sleep, many times a dose of one milligram might be better than a dose of 10 milligrams. Dr. Bentland has a question. Steve, can I take gummies to sleep? No. <laughs> no, sorry, I was supposed to read this question. Okay, um, I know, it's such a party pooper. No alcohol, no caffeine, no smoking, no gummies. But you're still all here listening, so this is great. <laughs> Healthy bunch here. Okay, how can I or we help uh, support your research? So thank you for asking. Um, as you may have heard this evening, we are really interested in engaging more research volunteers. So we would um, love for you to get in touch with us if you would like to participate in research. Um, it's also pretty special that we have an Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in Wisconsin, so please uh, spread the word. Not everybody knows that we have an Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, right here in Madison, so spread the word to your uh, friends and neighbors, anyone else that you know that's affected by the disease. Um, and of course, you are also welcome to um, contribute to the research as well. If you are in a position to make financial co contributions, we always welcome those, and they go to very good use um, for projects at the center. So thank you for asking. Follow-up question. Uh, uh, that, that, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Please, of course. Um, yeah, I think with the approval of aducanumab, um, a lot of people were saying, well, I want it to be approved by the FDA and I want to have access to it, but I don't want to be a guinea pig in a trial and to go through that. And I think that just drove home for me, again, having been a clinician for all these years and all of us, we, we so much want therapies and we can't, that FDA is never going to approve any medication or anything without people being a part of these clinical trials. So again, we're all in this together, so I just, I think I'm more passionate about it than I've ever been because we're getting so close, but it's a partnership, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this, I'm going to direct this to Dr. Astana. So uh, while the tone and report outs tonight have been hopeful and positive, well done presenters, the paucity of seeming progress for actually treating current Alzheimer's patients has been difficult and demoralizing. What are the most promising treatments on the horizon? And can you speak more about aducanumab? So I'm going to start with Dr. Astana on that. Sure, thank you. Well, um, I think the mo most promising treatments right now would be the anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies. So uh, immune therapies for Alzheimer's disease, I think, uh, have shown the best efficacy. We all know that Aricept is approved and, and uh, Mementine, these are approved medication, but they only improve symptoms. They never affect the disease process, the pathology going on in the brain. So the anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies cleared the brain of amyloid protein. That's been shown in multiple studies, and the effectiveness is quite significant. They really significantly cleared the brain of the amyloid protein. Uh, of course, aducanumab did not show any improvement in symptoms, at least in one of the studies, maybe some partial improvement, but overall, um, we don't believe that it improves symptoms. But licanumab, as I mentioned earlier, uh, did slow the progression of cognitive decline, and it also cleared the brain of amyloid protein. So I think that group of medications are the most promising, and there'll be newer forms of those medications that will come along. And at some stage, you don't have to take infusions. I think the efforts being made to develop uh, injections subcutaneously, and eventually, perhaps, uh, some better modes of delivery. But certainly, uh, those are most promising. Efforts being made to clear the tau protein in the brain, and they were, those are, again, immune treatments like anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies. There are trials going on, similar antibodies directed against tau. Um, and I think, uh, I think uh, you know, it remains to be seen, at least one of the studies uh, published was negative, but there are more studies going on uh, on the tau side. So the best treatment is a combination of therapies to clear both the amyloid 
and tau proteins. And I just want to make additional comment that even if we clear amyloid and tau protein, uh, the, the progression of the disease from preclinical to clinical stage, it just doesn't involve these proteins. It also involves multiple other environmental, social, sociocultural factors like poverty, your quality of education, how physically active are you, do you have comorbid medical conditions or not, like high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol problem, how well are they treated? So the progression from pre-symptomatic to symptomatic stages is not just driven by these abnormal proteins. There are other factors that come into play, and most of them are treatable and modifiable. And I think that's the message Dr. Carlson and, I, and Dr. Barchi were trying to give us, is that you need to manage those conditions better. So even if you have these proteins in your brain, you may not develop the symptoms because you've controlled the other things. Doesn't make sense. But I think the immune therapies are the best, most promising treatments right now. So Thank you, Dr. Oh. No, I just fully agree. I think there, but I think we're at a really exciting time. There's a, several medicines, so lecanemab, denanemab, that are gonna be going through the FDA. We'll see more, more data on lecanemab at the end of November. There's a meeting that we'll, a lot of us will be attending. They'll re release the results of that in more detail. So, so far they look very promising. It takes a little bit of time for the FDA to review it, because there are side effects which we need to be you know, thinking about. But I think it's a really exciting time for people with the disease, too, because there are some promising therapies out there. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. Dr. Chin, I understand you have a question in front of you. Or you're, you're, and you're welcome to address the last one as well. I, I did want to make one mention, because that's a wonderful question. And as a clinician who sees patients on a weekly basis, and I, and I see these changes, the one thing I would ask us is to consider what is treatment in an incurable disease right now. Because certainly as we have learned more, there's more education. There's more education for family members, caregivers, and the patient. But there's also more that we can do so that the quality of life is maintained and really become the focus of. That's palliative care. And so certainly we can make referrals to behavioral health because we know there are mood changes, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, Dr. Barzi in, sl in sleep. And so there's so much that we can do. It's actually an exhaustive list because there's lots that we can do to help a person's well-being. And while that may not directly impact the, the proteins of Alzheimer's disease, and a person's still going to decline, there's actually a lot of care that can be provided. And this care research program is really looking at that. What are the other systems? What are other things that we can do in the face of this? Certainly we're working on, on meaningful treatment with the immunotherapies, but that doesn't mean we don't look at all of these other systems of care that really make a difference for people. And so then the question that was asked of me is uh, when do you anticipate not needing lumbar punctures or MRI scans <laughs> in the RAP study? So Dr. Johnson's in the back there, so if we go ahead and ask him afterwards, I would say we still need these things for various reasons. Um, MRI scans are looking at different things than the blood-based biomarkers. And lumbar punctures, there's, there's a lot we can still look at in spinal fluid that we're still not sure we can look at in blood. And certainly it takes a while to validate blood, so we're really comparing them to things like lumbar punctures and spinal fluid. I think the nice thing is if you couldn't give a spinal fluid, if you couldn't have a lumbar puncture, that doesn't mean you're not contributing or participating, because certainly we can study your blood as well. So I think it's expanding the things that we can do, and it may not be stopping some of the things you may not want to do, uh, but certainly um, it, it, it is making it easier for us to understand what's happening in the body. Dr. Johnson, I hope that's an accurate answer. Double <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of uh, kind of things that are marketed to folks that supposedly help with uh, memory, one of the best known and notorious is Prevagen. So who would like to handle the Prevagen question? Does Prevagen help brain? Dr. <laughs> no hesitation from Dr. Carlson. Does, Dr. Does Prevagen help brain function? No. 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 Thank you. 
Okay, so we usually get a cannabis question, check, but it's a new era, psilocybin. So, uh, so get your thinking caps on here, who wants to answer this? Your thoughts on microdosing of psilocybin to help stave off the onset of Alzheimer's. Could it re-stimulate neural pathways and open up our receptors when we feel we are starting to forget things more and more <laughs> symptoms we become aware of? So uh, psilocybin is, is a hallucinogen and very actively being studied right now for the treatment of depression. And so anything in the uh, dementia space for psilocybin? Barb likes all the fun questions. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to answer those fun questions. Um, I will um, follow the lead of my colleagues here and say that there is no evidence yet to support uh, psilocybin in preventing dementia. But it's, you know, we have to keep our minds open to everything, I think, and there should be studies done, and, and we'll let you know when we hear the results of, of those studies. There are on clinicaltrials.gov is a site where every single clinical trial in the United States has to be registered. So if you just Google clinicaltrials.gov and put in whatever you're interested in, they'll have, if they have a study that they're looking in a placebo-controlled manner, it'll be on there. So there's a lot of things being studied that people have questions about, which is great. So another uh, really great pragmatic question here, and I'm not sure who, who wants to take this, but I've heard anesthesia can cause memory loss. What kind of anesthesia should we avoid? Any takers? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we actually do have some researchers who are looking at what we call post-operative cognitive, cognitive impairment. And for a long time, we've thought it was the anesthesia itself. And certainly some of the uh, inhalation anesthetics have been associated with it. But what we're starting to see is it's actually the variations in blood pressure that can occur during surgery. So we started to see that, oh, if you're having a cardiothoracic surgery or a big abdominal surgery, why did those people tend to have more cognitive change versus someone who's having cataract surgery or a knee replacement? And it seemed like the longer the procedure, the more medications that were being used, but also the variability in blood pressure. Our anesthesiologists have a lot to work on uh, during a surgery, because blood, you know, people are actually cutting in or doing some sort of intervention to a body, and it's going to respond. And so, blood pressure can go really high, or it can go really low, and, and those variations could be one of the main factors instead of the actual anesthesia. And certainly, the newer anesthetics that are being used have not been shown, at least according to the research uh, that our center has looked at, to, to have a direct relationship to causing uh, plaques or tangles. Um, now, other people can develop thinking changes after surgery, and that would be post-operative delirium, where you develop mm -hmm. acute confusion, and lots of different things can cause that. Um, but it's, a, it's a, an area of intense research because we need to understand um, what we should not be doing or what we should be focusing more on. Just one additional comment um, Dr. Chen mentioned about post-op delirium. Uh, that is a condition which is not uncommon, especially in older people. Um, and if someone goes to hospital, they go to surgery, and after the surgery, they are confused, disoriented, running around the hallways. Should that happen? Uh, in some people, in fact, that may be the first manifestation of dementia in the sense that many of these people have underlying undiagnosed dementia. And for the first time it comes to attention is when they go through surgery, and after anesthesia, are they all confused and, and, uh, and really pulling out the IV drips and th things like those. So if someone has post-op delirium, they don't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, please do ask your primary care physician to get that evaluated in case they had a pre-existing a, a pre dementia which was not diagnosed. Thank you. Well. That is our evening. I want to thank you all for these incredible questions, for your very active participation. And a big round of applause for our wonderful speakers, Drs. Bendlin and Shin and Astana and Barzi and Carlson.